Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things, and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my colleagues and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Alana Diamond. Alana is a managing partner at the 412 Venture Fund. Alana, welcome to the pod. Thank you. It's great to be here. Good to have you in. Thanks for coming. It's been a while since uh, we knew each other from the IW days. So. That's for sure. Pre-pandemic, right? Yeah. yeah it was back in the, in the good old days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So at the time when we met, Alana was running Alpha Lab Gear, which was the hardware accelerator from Innovation Works. Uh, a lot of fun. Uh, you you actually brought me in as a consultant there. So that was, I think, our first conversation. Yes, it was actually it was a a new program for us. We decided to have a weekly manufacturing sort of. I don't know, thinking through problems, and we brought in some experts who could help the companies, and you were one of them. Well, thank you. Yeah, and it was a lot of fun. I mean, to be honest, a lot of my job is, you know, contract engineering, which is, um, you know, you go in and you solve a really, really difficult long tail of a problem. But in that job, it was really nice because I got to be a consultant, which was like I, you come in and you tell someone else how to run their business, which is quite a luxury. <laughs> and so I, I and really then you walk it. away and it's up to them to implement it, right? Exactly. They get to do the hard work. <laughs> yeah. and, so, and I met, I was telling you before we start recording, but I'll repeat it for people listening. I met so many great connections through that program. Um, people like Mike from Mica and Uri, I mean, I knew Uri Eliza before that, but other folks that I'm still in touch with today, um, who Ben Matsky, who we were just talking about. That's um, right. Yeah, yeah, lots of lot, Dick Zhang, uh, lots of lots of good folks. So I um, I really really enjoyed that a lot, and the connections and I think the friendships I made through there were kind of you know just awesome, and, and it was you know a great shot in the arm I think for the whole Pittsburgh community. Well, that was actually one of our big goals was to create a community around folks who were interested in physical products, hardware, robotics, and so I'm really happy to hear that happened. Yeah, absolutely. I'm I'm happy I got to do it. So that was that was really fun. Thank you for including me. And thank you for joining us. I remember that you gave really good advice to a lot of the companies. I mean, these are folks who may never have manufactured anything before. And having experts like the folks you mentioned, who've done it not once, but 10 times or 20 times, or Mike for Mike, 100 times. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was just, it was it was invaluable advice for them and it saved so many of them from making expensive mistakes they got to make mistakes on our dime instead of theirs <laughs> that's awesome and it was really fun like as a as a consultant coming in too because just making friends with some of the other consultants was really nice like when we were sitting around that round table and the way it worked for people listening was uh, the startup founders would kind of come to the front of the room i think there was a projector some of them had decks some of them didn't some of them brought their product with them and then I don't know if it was like a horseshoe or like a long table, I can't remember. But there were a bunch of like us Statler and Waldorf type, you know, consultants in there. Oh, it was terrible. You know, like <laughs> just saying, you know, kind of stuff that is apparent to us because we'd done it before. But brainstorming with each other, you know, I think you should try. Well, what about this? Well, how about that? You know, and so it was it was really fun. Um, and, you know, it was just an interesting way to engage with other industry folks you know with experience building stuff and then also with the companies trying to build it so yeah i had a lot of fun doing that yeah i think one of the biggest benefits was the founders getting to hear the consultants or the experts talk among themselves because i think so many times founders you introduce them to somebody and they get an opinion and then they go somewhere else and they get another opinion and then they've got a third opinion they feel like they've got i don't know mentor whiplash they don't know who to follow <laughs> but in this case you gave an opinion and maybe um mike for micah or i think dave hockendoner was yep. there as well you know and they disagree with you and and the founder gets to hear you what your reasoning is right <laughs> and then at the end they can make their own decision, but they understand where each of you are coming from rather than having this back and forth where they really don't. Well, you said A and he said B and 
they don't understand that actually you probably agree, you know, there's just a, a slight difference in the assumptions you made or the conditions you had in mind. And when you sort of um, sink on those, you have the same advice for them. Yeah. So I think that was really valuable. I really enjoyed that part of it too, to be honest. And actually, it's funny you should say that because SKA has just announced its first official advisory board and we're oh. meeting up. Uh, we will have met up by the time this episode airs. But it's um, Kristen Stanton from Deep Local. Uh, she's their chief people officer. Just Pedersen from uh, RE Squared. She was their chief marketing officer uh, before the acquisition. And then Brian Beyer from Hellbender, uh, who's their president and CEO and was the chief product officer at Carnegie Robotics. And Just had the brilliant idea because I've, you know, I've had a lot of mentors and advisors um, through the seven and a half years or so I've, I've had SKA. But I've never gotten them all in a room together. And that was Jess's idea. She was like, you should get all these people in a room together. And so we've got the official advisory board, which is those, those three. And we've got like a larger number of unofficial advisors that couldn't be listed for one reason or another. Um, but the official ones, at least, are all going to be getting together. Um, and you know, it should be a lot of fun to actually see how that plays out, where I'm on the receiving end of the advice <laughs> rather than the giving end. So. I think it's a great format, and I'm, I'm excited. I, I'm surprised I never put the dots together and, and stole it off you guys before Just recommended it. So it's funny. I thought you were going to go in a different direction with that when you said advisory board. I thought you were going to put together an SKA advisory board that you would offer to companies. You know it's what I mean? It's not a bad idea. So they could come in with a problem, and um, you would assemble a group of folks to sort of address Think about, discuss, work through that problem. Yeah, but well, I mean, we do that already. That <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's that's like one of our offerings. So if, if we're doing consulting, we we usually go in in like a two person team to start, uh -huh. and that's kind of part of our sales process. Is in the beginning we'll go in, and usually it's me and some kind of a subject matter expert on what the company is facing down, and then we kind of give a taste of the sorts of knowledge and insight we'll bring to the table that way. Then we engage, and then we go into you know a full-on contract engineering arrangement, typically. Uh -huh. But some clients only want consulting. Yeah, it's not been our. It's not been like a big base of work for us recently, but I mean it's something we can still do. So yeah, uh, it's an interesting idea. I think it, it was just so helpful to the company. So. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, if SKA were to offer that, the scope would be limited to technology. We should not be telling you how to run your business, but <laughs> we can at least tell you how to build your product. <laughs> so. Or you could assemble a, a group of business experts. <laughs> I don't think that's my sport. <laughs> 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 Having enough trouble trying to figure out how to run my own business. <laughs> You're staying in your lane. <laughs> For now. I mean, maybe my lane will expand in the future, but I, I want to do what I'm good at. Makes sense. Uh, thanks. It'd be like me trying to give somebody technical expertise. <laughs> <laughs> that would not be smart. <laughs> but I mean, I value your business expertise. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so, so tell me a little bit about 412 Venture Fund. I, I, I've been wanting to learn more about this since you started it. And this is like the first time we're really getting to sit down. Yeah. Well, thanks for asking. You're welcome. So um, 412 Venture Fund was really, it was founded by four founders ourselves. All of us founded companies, raised venture capital ourselves, expanded the companies, and then exited. A couple of us did it more than once. And all of us did it, um, at least for the first time in Pittsburgh, you know, our first companies in cool. Pittsburgh. And we all ran into the same um, sort of issue that bothered us a little bit. And that was that we ended up raising capital from outside the area in most cases. And then when we were successful, you know, the capital goes back outside the area. And when we looked at these communities like the Bay Area, New York, and to a certain extent, Austin, maybe Boston to a certain extent. Yeah. Um, what you had was founders who'd been successful and exited um, found funding the next round of founders. And so it, you were building wealth within the community, and that wealth was being fed back to fund the next round of startups. And we looked at that and we thought, boy, we'd really like to do that in Pittsburgh. Nice. And yeah, and so when we went to go out and fundraise for our, for our venture fund, we called up all the people who were founders when we first founded <laughs> our companies. You That's know, the awesome. people that we used to cry to when we had problems that we celebrated with. And uh, you and I were just mentioning some of those names, folks like Raul Valdez Paris, the founder of Vivissimo, Norm Sade, the founder of Wombat, um, 
Luis Fanon, you know, uh, over at Duolingo with Severn Hacker. Cool. And a lot of folks like that. The founders, uh, uh, Sunil and Akash from um, iGate, you know, if you go back a little further. And those folks um, all invested in our fund. And so now we've got this fund that's probably 80% of the funds came from experienced founders. That's awesome. Like ourselves, yeah. yeah. And and many of them are willing to put in more than just money. And so what happens? Well, uh, when we invest in a company, um, I'll give you an example. We invested in a cybersecurity company called Valley Cyber, also a company that uh, was a CMU founder who we knew from his previous two companies, Anthony cool. Gadiant. So it's a cybersecurity company and um, we put money in and we've got you know, um, uh, a board observer seat in this case. And so we go to Norman Sade, who led Wombat, cybersecurity company, had a successful exit. Hey, hey, Norman, how would you like to take our board observer seat and be an advisor to this company? Nice. He says, yeah, I'd love to do that. So we go to the CEO. Hey, how would you like to have this person be your uh, board observer? Anthony's great, you know, somebody who recently exited a similar company, has connections, knows where all the potholes are and how to help me avoid them. So we're able to sort of leverage this uh, relevant recent experience of founders for our next group of founders that we're investing in. That's awesome. And so that's kind of our, I'd say our secret sauce. That's really cool. And you can't really fake that. I mean, like experience and community, right? That's it only comes from being in the trenches with those people. Yeah. So that's that's awesome. I, I really think Pittsburgh's been needing something like that for a while. And um, it's good to see you guys putting it together and actually making it happen. So that's, that's really exciting. Well, thanks. You know, it's funny because um, several of the people that invested in our fund talked to us about how they had been considering starting their own fund. And, you know, would we still be interested in having them? And our reaction was, absolutely. If every single one of our investors decides after this experience to go out and launch a fund in Pittsburgh, we don't see that as competition. We see that as success. That's part of our goal is to get more venture capital right here in this region. You know, Pittsburgh is one of the top innovation cities in the country, maybe even in the world, but for sure in the U.S. Yeah. And yet there's, you know, less venture capital than in some of these other places where we have we have more innovation and less capital maybe and so we're trying to you know match those a little better and so several of our partners who are very active in the fund have told us their next step is going to be to raise a fund great we will be really happy to collaborate with you awesome yeah Yeah, that's that's really great and i mean from the outside looking in my understanding is that like a lot of times venture capitalists will invest in uh don't take this the wrong way, but like in packs. So like, you know, you get a bunch of co-investors at every round. And so that just seems, you know, conducive to like, you know, building investment rounds faster and getting these companies the fuel they need when they need it to expand and, and not stagnate. So, I mean, that, that seems like a great thing for the community here. Yeah. And by the way, we believe in syndicating rounds, not doing it alone. You know, there are a number of reasons for it. One is one of the big things that we can provide besides you know, hopefully relevant advice and money is help raising the next round. Because, you know, there's some founders I've heard who say they spend a huge percentage of all their time raising that next round. Oh, I yeah. mean, they, you know, it's almost a, like a uh, lot of them are my customers. Yeah. <laughs> so. It's like politicians who the minute they win an election, they start on the next one, right? Yep. It's the same thing. And so if you've got investors in your round, if you've got four investors instead of one, that's four times the network. That's four times the people who can get out there and help you raise that next round. So you're not spending your entire life raising money. You can run the company. So it's good for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. And I mean, if the connections dovetail in, if some of those investors, like you said, are, are invested in different rounds, I mean, that's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. I have to tell you, one of the things that most surprised me about starting this fund was how many calls I got from outside the area, from the Bay Area, from New York, from Japan. I was just going to ask that. From Japan, from Israel. And, you know, people saying, hey, I've read so much about what's going on in Pittsburgh. You know, we don't have any eyes or ears on the ground. Can I meet with you once a quarter and just hear what you've been seeing? Will you call me when you find anything in this category? Because we'd like to participate. And we've found investors who we've invested two, three times with, you know, company after company. From outside the region. Oh, yeah. That's awesome. Like I said, all those places that I named and more. That's awesome. Do you 
Uh, I think Gal Inbar mentioned your name the other yes. day, by the way. How do you know that guy? So um, Speaking of Israel. <laughs> yeah, he's the executive director of 412 by 972. That's right. Right. And yeah. uh, that is a, a group that is working to connect the Israeli and the Pittsburgh tech ecosystems and, uh, you know, in both directions. Yeah. And uh, he's been on the podcast, by the way. Oh, really? I yeah. didn't know that. OK. Well, I'm actually on his board. In That's fact, awesome. we had a meeting today. He's mentioned that to me. That's great. Uh, OK. And I was going to say that I, I actually had forgotten I was going to try to introduce the two of you if you didn't know each other, because it seems like there'd be a lot of connection. Yeah. Not only do we know each other, but we've uh, we've been working together in some capacities. Uh, he's Wonderful. a great dude. I like him a lot. Great. Well, he's definitely a robotics guy. He, yeah. he knows hardware. And so anyway, yeah. So um, my, my partner, Andy Rabin at 412 Venture Fund, he is the chair of the board of 412 by 972. I did not know that. Small yeah. world. <laughs> and so um, I, I typically spend a couple months a year in Israel and um, we go scouting for companies. So, That's really cool. Yeah. Any interesting stuff coming out of Israel lately? I mean, I've heard Gal's perspective on this, but I'm curious to hear yours. I, we've seen a lot. Yeah. Um, you know, I think especially in hardware and robotics, there's more interesting tech that isn't getting funded there because there's so much interest in two things, health. Everybody wants to be a health company. Whereas in the U.S., if you've got a technology that could be useful, I don't know, in IoT or manufacturing or in healthcare, you know, healthcare has got FDA and all the regulatory. And a lot of times people will look for a different path first and then pivot to uh, it's hundreds of millions of dollars to get through those hurdles a lot of times. Exactly. And so people are really doing the opposite. Whereas in Israel, it seems like if you've got tech that could be applicable in healthcare, everybody wants to do that. Do they that. not have to go through FDA trials there? Or like, what's the difference, do you think, and why, why that is? So I think it has nothing to do with that. I think, the, A, they're very technically focused. They're not business founders for the most part. And I think, B, there were a couple of very big successes early in the Israel, Israeli tech ecosystem. The two areas where there were very big successes were the defense market, yeah, of course, <laughs> and, and, and maybe cybersecurity, things like that, security and defense. They kind of go hand in hand. I mean, Right. Yeah. And healthcare. And so I think that's where there's funding for, because just like I was talking about, people have big exits. They became venture capitalists and investors in early oh, stage Oh, they companies. want to invest in like companies to Things theirs. they know, yeah. things they understand. Yeah. Yeah. And so you see a lot of that. That's That makes a lot of sense to me. Yep. So anyway, yeah, that's we're, we've been looking at a number of companies. We've gotten close on some. We're looking at some right now. And I'm hopeful that in the next couple of months, we'll make our first investment. They yeah. have to, companies have to have a U.S. entity that owns the technology uh, yeah. and the intellectual property for us to invest. So That's interesting. Yeah. Why is that? Just out of curiosity. Well, a couple things. First of all, we don't have the bandwidth to fully understand the laws in other countries. I know how that is. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, we don't want to get stuck in a situation where, oh, we thought the company owned that. They don't own it, you know. The government so, can just take it away or yeah, you know, something or, different. <laughs> or, oh, you can't just make that change. That would be better for the business. So we really... It turns out there's a regulation against that. Exactly. Uh, thunk it. <laughs> so we looked at a company we loved that was based in France. Just loved the company. If it were had a U.S. entity, we would have invested. But we don't understand European Union law, and um, we weren't confident in our ability to get to a place where we'd really feel comfortable. So we invest in companies that have a U.S. entity that owns the technology. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, we are trying to get into more international markets, but to date, like, all of SKA's business has been U.S. domestic. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, the reason for that is, you know, I know how to enforce an NDA in the United States. I know how to write a contract in the United States. Um, you know, we know kind of what you know you can and can't do within the constructs of U.S. law. But then when you start making it international again, it's just it's a lot more expensive from a legal perspective, and it's there's so many different things that could get you, and it's just it's just really the cost of doing business for us. So uh, very similar, yeah. and you know, we don't even know what we don't know. I mean, when we invest in a founder, one of the things we really like to see is that they know what they know and they know what they don't know. In an early stage founder, in an early stage company, there are going to be holes. That they're just, ha you know, there have to be. Yeah. But the key is knowing what they are, knowing what those risks are, yeah. feeling comfortable with those risks, and having a founder who knows the things they don't know and is open to getting either advice or additional team members who do know those things. And how we feel about 
European law and Israeli law and you know law in other countries is we don't even know what we don't know. Yeah, yeah that so, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, there's certain Israeli companies that are fascinating to me. So like, I'm a big fan of Polygon and Aperio, which is their subsidiary. And I think they're doing awesome stuff. I really like Shmoyel at Aperio. That guy is, is great, <laughs> if you're listening. <laughs> um, and I'm a big fan. But, you know, yeah, like you said, there's just a lot of hurdles, which is, you know, why we're kind of inching up to these things, but haven't crossed that line yet. It's interesting for me to hear that they even have those issues in engineering consulting. You know, because for us, we're thinking about all the financial issues and the regulatory issues and ownership issues. Yeah. And so I guess well, maybe that's part of, of it. Can... A lot of it's just legal document understanding enforcement and, and that mm-hmm. sort of thing for us. Um, confidentiality, um, obviously. And then with us trying to kind of move toward, you know, U.S. government markets as, as the customer base. Um, you know, there's a lot of regulations and restrictions around, you know, what amount of a project you're able to offshore. And we already do have a few existing clients who are defense contractors in the U.S. And so for those customers, we're sort of limited to uh, United States uh, labor. And so, um, you know, it it just kind of complicates things. I recently made friends with um, the founder of an Israeli product company, and I bought one of their early stage prototypes, uh, mainly to be supportive, but also because I thought it was kind of cool and I wanted one. And just paying for the thing with a credit card um, you know, with the whole form being in Hebrew and there was like some number on there that I didn't know what it was and I had to figure out what that was and it was this back and that was just to pay with a credit card. And so I don't know. I mean that's again Google Translate. I used Google Translate. Oh, did you? Yeah. <laughs> I, I used it on my phone, I looked at the text, it translated immediately. But I mean, I don't know, it, it, like, I still had to put in my credit card like four different times. Yeah. I had to talk to the founder of this company back and forth. And then finally, he fed me like a string of numbers in a certain order that for the one weird field, I didn't know what it was. Once I got that in, I was able to purchase this thing. They wouldn't take an American Express card. I was worried about my visa getting stolen if the form wasn't secure. Um, I don't know. There were like little, little, and I know Amex is like easier to reverse a rogue transaction on. So there were like little things like that where like, you know, I, I sort of would know how to cover my rear within the bounds of like a US to US transaction. But even on like, you know, a like 400 shekels or whatever that was like it wasn't a lot of money you know it was like you know a little bit complicated just to make that go through like, yeah not tremendously complicated i mean it was i was buying a consumer product but more complicated than it should have been i should say yeah i'm, I'm really surprised because i would think that israel's such a small market that they they should be used to selling outside the country so that's interesting to me that they weren't yeah I mean, and it, it may have just been that one company in particular right like yeah. it I would think it wouldn't be that hard to get like a Venmo or a PayPal account and just link it to your oh, company in any country. But now you're having to build something in the U.S. in order to deal with the U.S. market. Yeah. So I don't know. It probably just depends like where you're selling to and, and who you know there. And I don't know. I, I don't want to go too far down the international business uh, rabbit hole. But another thing I will say is if we were to do that, you know, I feel like an important part of it would just be to to know people closely in that market and to have some you know, collaborators and just people that have experience working in that market and ideally have lived there for their whole lives and, you know, have a strong relationship that way. Yep. And that's how we pick the countries where we invest yep, makes outside the sense. U.S. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so we've got those kind of connections. And so um, we feel a little more comfortable. We get warm intros. Yeah, that's awesome. And I, I will say to Gal, you've been doing a great job introducing me to lots and lots of people from Israel. So I appreciate you. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Good. So what other projects are you working on now? Any, I mean, any investments you can talk about that you're excited about? Um, I guess investments that we've already made, I can talk about. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're very excited about Arieka. Are you familiar with them? I am. I didn't know how to pronounce their name properly. I might not be doing it right. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And actually, they started at Alpha Lab Gear. They're the guys, um, if I'm not mistaken, and correct me if I get it wrong, but they have a thermally insulative rubber. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's what's their founder's name again? Navid. Navid. I like that guy a lot. I haven't seen him in years. I. Yeah. Oh, you a beer in a vid. <laughs> <laughs> and then his co-founder is Carmel Majidi, who cool. is probably the most prolific CMU entrepreneur 
you know, uh, entrepreneurial professor. Unbelievable. Uh, you know, we're invested in two of his companies. The other one is Estat Actuation, which is an electrostatic Stuart clutch. Diller. He's coming yes. on here soon. Oh, really? Well, yeah. he's great, too. Yeah, and, I like that guy a lot. Yeah, fabulous. And then the third one, Lifeware, um, we just recently introduced them to someone who... Um, just told me today that he's working as their sort of contract CEO, um, at least temporarily. I don't know if it's full time or, but it's a contract CEO position. That's cool. So yeah, so and I know that Carmel's had other companies. So he's, you know, he's just like a entrepreneurial machine. <laughs> Some of those guys are like that. It, it's kind of interesting. Um, mm -hmm. I don't want to go into particular names because I feel like that's a whole rabbit hole I don't want to get into right now. But well, there's actually a CMU professor who I think has had eight. Exits. Oh, wow. Yes. It's not Red Whitaker, is it? No, it's Alex Weibel. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Jibigo and M. Modal and then a bunch of... M. Modal was... Yeah, it was him. It was, was him and Michael. was a 3M acquisition, right? Right. It was um, yeah. Michael Finke was his number two. Cool. And then um, he's had a bunch of them in uh, in Europe because he's originally German. That's awesome. Yeah, that's eight exits. That's wild. I know, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, we had dinner with I'm him recently, and he was talking about it because he flies in in his helicopter, <laughs> <laughs> which I guess you can do when you've had eight exits. You're, when you're that fancy, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's really cool. I mean, it's interesting, too, because, I mean, you think of, I don't know how involved he is with his current portfolio, but I feel like some of these guys, like, will you know, sort of start a company up and then, you know, either be very distant. Some of them are very advisory and like stay involved in the day to day. Some of them seem like they kind of want to do the next thing and get bought out. Um, I don't know. Uh, it's it's just interesting to see the different approaches that work for different people. And then the disciples people seem to bring up around them that follow their approach, but, you know, from a different part of town. So, yeah, no, I agree. And and, you know, one thing that I'll say about Carmel and I don't know about Alex, I assume he's also a great mentor. I just know him personally better. But one of the things that I really admired in Carmel is his ability to mentor his students into taking on a CEO role in a company and uh, to see the growth in in those folks in that CEO role, you know, from startup to where they are today. And I, I sit on the board of both uh, Estat and Arieka for 412 Venture Fund. I didn't We're, realize those had a common advisor. That's that's cool. They do have a common, they're both from Carmel's, Carmel's lab. lab. That's interesting. And Carmel sits on the board also, you know, of both of those. And just to see that growth as a yeah. CEO, it's just, it's really been I'm a satisfying. big fan of Naveed and of Stuart, so I like those guys a lot. I have not met Carmel yet. I would like to, though. Invite him on the show. Yeah. They just did a really good... Make an good, intro. I will. Thank you. I will. Remind me. Send me an email to remind me. But um, I, I, they just did a piece on him in Technically, I think. Oh, or, cool. Yeah, or maybe the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. That's Big awesome. Big piece on his lab. Yeah. And That's really cool. startups. Yeah. So. That's pretty neat. Um. Yeah, I was always more proximate to, to Red's work just because I worked in the Field Robotics Center after I got my master's degree. And I was never super close with Red personally, but I think like Red Zone Robotics, Astrobotic, um, those are the two that come to mind right now. I'm sure there's more. I'm sorry, Red. Um, there's another one that was doing inspections of pipes. That's Red Zone Robotics. Oh, really? I thought, th okay. Okay. I thought there was another one that was doing smaller pipes. Um, do you know who I'm talking I'm, about? Anyway. I'm thinking of a certain one, but I don't know if it's red related. Oh, okay. Might yeah. not be. Um, there's there's a bunch of them, actually. Was though. Carnegie Robotics uh, his? So I, I think I think John Bayers was one of Red's students, is okay. my understanding. And then I okay. think Near Earth Autonomy, um, blanking on the owner's name right now. It might Kevin. be Sebastian. Oh, is it Sebastian? I thought it was, I, I thought the CEO was uh, Kevin Dowling? Dowell. Kevin Dowling ran uh, Carta. Oh, or, you're right. Yeah, and they but they were a near earth autonomy spin out. So yes. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And so he's also been on the podcast. Oh, okay. So. Is his name Sanjeev? Is Sanjeev, yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I conflated him with someone. You're right, Sanjeev. I don't know him personally, so that's why like that one I'm not as close to, but I've just yeah. been following. But apparently, I don't know, I've got like a you know, I think all those guys were like Red's PhD students. Oh so really? It's kind of interesting. interesting. Yeah. It's kind of like Carmel. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. You know, he just he he has a PhD student. They have a project. He says this could be a company, and then he coaches them, and it's it's really great. It's great for the region. It's great for CMU. I think it's it's great for the students. Yeah, for sure. No, and and I mean, you know, it's 
I like to see Pittsburgh get economically empowered and, you know, all of these, um, you know, companies kind of you know, pop up here and, you know, bring up our real estate values and create clients for SKA, <laughs> <laughs> do all kinds of good things. Uh, <laughs> so. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy about, about, you know, kind of the situation we find ourselves in. Um, so speaking of real estate values, do you think Pittsburgh is going to be like sort of like the economical place to have a robotics company for much longer? Or do you think that's kind of going away, you know, as we get more economically developed? So, you know, it's interesting you ask that because I think robotics companies tend to require a little bit of space, you know, yeah, and commercial real estate has struggled all over the country, not just uh, in Pittsburgh. And I, I can't speak as an expert on commercial real estate, but just from what I read around the country, commercial real estate has been struggling post pandemic because so many people aren't going back to the office. And so I wonder if it will continue to potentially be, you know, somewhat more economical. Yeah, it. I think you might be right. It, it's interesting, though, because I, I have some friends that are, you know, founders and, um, you know, they, they've told me about some of the real estate deals they've gone through where, like, they'll be looking at warehouse space in an inexpensive part of town, maybe a little underdeveloped. Um, like, I, I had a friend that was looking at, I think it was the, um, I want to say the Fort Pitt Brewing Company in Sharpsburg, if that's the right one. Mm -hmm. But I might have the, the name a little bit off. Um, but when they found out he was had a robotics company, um, like the cost per square foot went up almost by a factor of three. Because like, oh, robotics company, you've got money. Huh. And they're like, we're going to put in, you know, all this, you know, pane glass and we're going to make it really nice. And he's like, I'm going somewhere else. You know? So I'll <laughs> so tell you something funny. It was grungy. <laughs> I moved my company here from Chicago. And when I was looking for real estate, we looked a little bit in the strip district. OK, yeah, I could have bought like a hundred thousand square foot building for 25 grand. Are you serious? I am completely serious. When would serious. this have been? This was, uh, let's see, uh, I was pregnant with my third kid. So 1996. That's wild. Yeah. So the strip district now, for I mean, that would be like in the millions, I would think. Right. Yeah. Now, I'm going to tell you, you would have put hundreds of thousands or maybe even a, a million, I don't know, in those dollars, probably hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in improvements. It wasn't in great shape. Yeah. It had been some kind of distribution warehouse. Like Five grand. I know, right? <laughs> and at the time I thought, oh my gosh, I'm moving a company here. I had three kids under the age of six. I am not going to renovate a building. I know nothing about real estate. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm moving to a new city. I'm not going to, you know, do this. And so we ended up renting a space. But I will tell you, we rented a space. I think we paid six dollars a square foot. That's awesome. Yeah, and yeah. they they improved it for us. That's great. In Oakmont. Nice. Yeah. So yeah, Oakmont's a good area now. Yeah, it is. It was a good yeah. area then too. Nice. Sorry, so. <laughs> I didn't mean to imply it wasn't. <laughs> no, yeah. it's okay. So yeah. So anyway, now I I was just thinking about this the other day. What if I'd bought that building? <laughs> I mean, coulda, woulda, shoulda. Like that'll yeah. eat you alive. I feel like. I know. <laughs> I know. For twenty five thousand, though, you almost couldn't have lost. I mean, even if you did nothing to it, I'm assuming some developer would have bought it up off you for hundreds of thousands. Honestly, that would be true. But then it would just be a real estate investment because I needed a place for my business. So you wouldn't have done that. I so couldn't that's do not that. Even, yeah, no. that's not even a time machine knob you can even hypothetically twist. No, no. Although I could have, I could have built a condo on top <laughs> nice <laughs> uh, that's what made me think about it is you know i was looking at some of those condos in the strip district unbelievable so it is crazy how much that area came up like i, I think the cork factory was like the first like expensive apartment building in the mm -hmm. strip district where i mean i thought my friends were crazy for like renting a place in there for like 2k a month or whatever um in like the early 2010s you know and i'm just like yeah. what are you thinking that's so much money you know yeah yeah and then and now it's like commonplace there's like you know one on every block there i feel like that's similar market so. same thing with east liberty when we moved alpha lab gear there people thought what are you doing yeah. <laughs> and now look at it it's you know full of startups yeah that's so. awesome and we did it that might have had Bakery to do Square. with you guys though to be fair i mean oh i hope so yeah <laughs> <laughs> nice <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I know we're getting close to time here. Is there anything you want to plug kind of at the tail end of the conversation? Well, I guess I'd just like to say that if anybody out there knows of a company or has an early stage company that has a product in the market 
and customers, whether they're pilot or paying, paying's better, but pilot's okay too. And they're looking to raise a round of, let's say, at least a couple million dollars. Our first check size, typically half a million to a million bucks, and then we'll double down on about a third of those companies. Uh, technology enabled, we love B2B SaaS, AI, um, cybersecurity, love advanced materials, robotics, um, technology that enables robotics like sensors and advanced materials. And clutches. Yes, and clutches. <laughs> and um, health related as well, not uh, not pharma or drug discovery, but um, health, uh, health health IT in, particularly, in particular. Um, please do reach out to us, 412venturefund.com, and uh, we would be very happy to take a look at the business. And if it isn't a fit for us, to make recommendations. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming out, and I really hey, appreciate thanks. it. thanks. Good seeing you. Good seeing you, too. Thanks for joining us today. If you made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes, too. Collaborative with Spencer Krause is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krause is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. If you're in the market for robotics contract engineering services, please consider hiring SKA Custom Robots and Machines. They sponsor this podcast and they solve some of the toughest engineering challenges in the world. SKA Custom Robots and Machines can be found at ska.solutions. Thanks again and see you on the next one.